All right, let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Welcome those of you who are joining us online as we um, um, uh, begin to uh, uh, delve a little bit deeper into this parable of the prodigal son. So let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing, and then we'll open the floor for some questions. Heavenly Father, um, what a fantastic parable. What a fantastic word you have given us. I mean, we're just in awe of it. We're continually in awe of it. And so I pray that you'll monitor our hearts and our minds as we uh, delve deeper into some of the subjects, ask some, uh, perhaps some really hard to answer questions, and just pray that you will bless our conversation and our understanding as we continue on with this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you get first shot. Correct. Okay. Um, when we speak today about look about the Bible, you say the Father is God, and the Son, the two sons, is the one is a gentle, and another is a Gabriel. Uh, now you're talking about the symbolism of the prodigal son. Um, we have to be very careful, and you'll you'll always hear me. And the question, if you didn't hear it. Is, is the symbol of, an, uh, of symbolism of the prodigal son, is the father in this story referring directly to God? It, are the sons, like for instance, the Gentiles and the Hebrews in, in, in the way that that is taught? Actually, I've never heard that about the sons. That's an interesting take um, on that. But we, we want to be very careful that we don't read things into the, the text. And so the parable was taught by Jesus as a simple story from everyday life that told a principle. The principle is going to be how our Father loves us and the plan of redemption. So in that sense, yes, I would have to say that, that the, the Father in this story, we can, without really feeling we are stretching the truth, we can say, well, no, I, I think that really is. Um, kind of reflecting the Father. But that's as far as we want to take it. We don't want to find out anything about the nature of the Father as opposed to the nature of the, of the Son or the Holy Spirit and those things. Because we did draw with the other two um, um, parables. The first one is all about a shepherd. Well, that's very much Christ's symbolism. second one is the light of the Holy Spirit looking for the, the coin. So there is definitely, I, I don't think we're stretching um, or reading or allegorizing. You familiar with an allegory and what an allegory is? An allegory is a story where every part of it has some meaning. Like to have an allegory would mean that God, the Father is God, one son is the Hebrews, one son is the Jews. Well, that's, that's tr creating an allegory out of a story that's not an allegory. So we don't want to get too clever about that. But you see, Jesus is the one in the first two of these parables that gave us an application. In other words, let me just, just read it. I mean, he, he is very specific about that. When he gets to the, to the end of the story of the sheep, he says, just so. Okay, I've just given you a parable of a lost sheep and a shepherd that finds it. He says, in the same way... Let me tell you something that is true. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Well, he's bringing the story home and applying it to the plan of redemption. Okay? So for us to do the same thing is perfectly acceptable because he's done it. He did the same thing after the coin. But that's about as far as we want to take it. We don't want to get real clever and say that every part of the story means something because then then we create doctrine and principles that the story isn't teaching okay now the the rule of thumb is this and and, and it's the rule of thumb that I've, I've tried to use is that if we have a parable like these three that and, and let's just take the whole idea of the sovereignty of the of the searcher okay the sovereignty of God in election well Jesus never actually states that but he gives us two clear parables where the one being searched for has nothing to do with being found. It is all on the seeker. 
So it's okay for us to look at the rest of Scripture where there is clear teaching about the sovereignty of God and election. And I read last week a whole bunch of Scripture passages toward that end. It's okay if that is being taught in Scripture to say, well, this parable is an illustration of that truth. That's perfectly okay because Jesus used his parables as illustrations of truth. And so, but we don't want to say, okay, if there was nothing else said in Scripture about the sovereignty of God and election, and the parable was the only thing we had, well, we would be reading something into the parable to try to project our thought onto it. Does that make sense? Yeah, we really want to pull our doctrine from elsewhere, but we can find great illustrations in the parable. That's an excellent question. That's a very important distinction that, that we have there. Okay, yes, ma'am. Um, when you're going over the original sin, <clears throat> you said that Adam and Eve were, were willing to separate from God. Do you, do you think they really like, cognitively recognized that by disobeying, they were going to actually like, have that? That's, that's, that's a really, really great question. question. And, of course, I can't completely answer that because it is not addressed in the story. But I, I, it is made very clear. First of all, let, let's, let's back up. Um, Adam and Eve are at the top of the gene pool. Okay? So as far as we're concerned, they would be almost superhuman. They, they, they would be not only in their stature, in their perfect looks, but also in their intellect. Okay, they had, I mean, remember when she's being tempted, she is still in the full-blown image of God. Okay, and the fact that we can reason, the fact that we can be rational in our thought is a result of even our fallen image of God. So she's, she's not there. She's being tempted. She's the only person, Adam and Eve are the only two people besides Jesus who actually had free choice. Okay, she had a choice. So when God says, and you are, now the only thing I could say in their defense is that, and, and again, a, a um, riveting story by C.S. Lewis called Paralandria of, a, uh, of science fiction, but of an Eve who had no concept of what evil was and trying to understand that you're up against evil. And, and for, them, for them, I can say that up until that point, they had no idea what was evil. And they had no idea what was a lie. But they did know what God said. They did know that he said, and so, the, the, again, the temptation, you have to bait, gauge it on the temptation. What was the temptation? The temptation is articulated by the serpent, and the Holy Spirit made enough of, a, of an importance of it to record it, that you will be like God, that you will know the difference between good and evil. That's the name of the tree, for goodness sakes, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And that is the sin of humanity. We want to be our own gods. Even now, we want to say that, okay, I know what God says about this particular issue, but even within the church... We are saying we've got to find a way around that so that we can jive what the Bible says with the culture. And, and guess what? If it comes down to the culture and the Bible, usually the culture wins. So, yeah. so yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a great question. But um, I, I do believe that they, were, they might not have expressed it to themselves that way. But I believe that what Jesus is presenting to us, and again, I'm not going to pull doctrine from it. I can't. But I believe that, that when God says, you will surely die if you do this, and you do it, then you are taking a calculated risk that you're going to die to God. That you're, Whatever relationship you have, what is death? I don't even know what death is. What, what, what is death? You know, but whatever it is, it's separation from God. It's something that he commanded me not to do. So, and, and again, if we want to look at it, the, the, the Garden of Eden is a fascinating study. 
It is a fascinating study, and, and I, I, I lament the fact that so many people get off on, well, what is it six days or six eons? You know, I mean, it is a fascinating study about marriage, primarily, because it's the only institution that God thought enough of to give us the perfect version of before the fall. Everything else happens after the fall. Boy, marriage happens there in the garden. So, I mean, you know, what, what he does in the garden is really interesting. But when, 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 the, when it, the way that Eve is tempted, um, I believe, tells us that she knew that I sin, I die. And if I die, obviously, he dies to me. But, but I, I don't care because I want to have the knowledge of, of sin, uh, of good and evil. I want to be able to be autonomous. That's a word that, that, that is good for us to know because we use it in a different way here. Um, automatic. What does automatic mean? Automatic means it does it itself. So auto, it really means self. Nomos means the law. To be autonomous means I, I set my own rules. I set my own laws. Nobody tells me what to do. Oof. It's like the, that she was like duped. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, she she was deceived. Deceived. The Bible says that she was deceived. So, and Satan is really good at what he does. Okay, he did lie, he did deceive, and in her defense, she had never had any experience with evil. You know, there are people that you run into here that just are kind of in la la land, you know, everything is good, everything is happy. You know, God is in his heaven and all is right with the world type of, of idea. Um, and, and you wonder, well, have you ever been in the presence of true evil? And, and do you understand that? Well, neither Adam nor Eve did. Um, now, and that, of course, is assuming that God didn't. That God used to come and talk to them in the evenings. And what did God talk about? Obviously, there was some kind of teaching going on, some kind of communication, some kind of growth that was occurring. How long did that go on? We're not told. So you can assume that if there was a presence of evil, that God would have explained it or at least mentioned it. But again, we don't know. That's not, that, that is not, that's pure conjecture. Questions? Heavy stuff. Um, well, if you don't have any questions for me, I have some questions for you. Okay. About the squandering of, of the money and thinking of the squandering of the inheritance, and I thought of Esau. Yeah. 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 He's, he's a great example, example of doing exactly, exactly the same thing. In fact, he's used as an example um, very strongly to explain what squandering is. The, the, the idea of, of uh, you, you look back to that story of Esau, and you say, what a waste. To you, you, you get two thirds of your father's everything that he has. Your brother gets one third because you were born. You were pulled out first, right? You were born first, and, and so therefore you get twice as much as he did. You get the lion's share, and you're going to give that up because you're hungry. Yeah, that's that is flippant, you know, um, scattering uh, of squandering. So yes, that 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 is the word. What I, what really struck me um, was th the next definition. Uh, sometimes to go and look up the Greek definition of these words is really revealing. And when the Greek, de when the Greek dictionary says of reckless living, it was a madness that knows no bounds, okay? Madness that has no boundaries. And, and boy, that's, that's what it is. You're talking about a young man who has no boundaries, nothing to hold him in check, and he can sin all he wants to. And he will push it and push it and push it until he's wallowing in the mire with the pigs. Okay? And praise God that he brought a famine along because he might have lived through that and died in his sins. And God brought providentially brought a famine to make it so it was impossible for him to do that. I mean, that, that was... Yeah, yeah. That's, 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 that's another example of, of God's providence in that. 
Any more questions? All right, let me ask you all a question. Oh, yes, sir, I'm sorry. Um, when, when, when Eve was deceived and, 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 and also Adam, right. Right, um, death was pronounced on mankind at that time, and it was an instant death. It was to have been dying over the, over the years and centuries. But uh, when it said that we are the dead and our trespasses and sins, Depends on, depends on what the definition of is is. Um, it, it depends on the way that you're looking at um, what it means to be saved. Okay, remember that word saved is a word that speaks of the whole process. Okay, so yes, we are saved when we are glorified and we leave this world and we leave our body of sin behind. And there's no more sin, there's no more sorrow. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Okay, let, let's go back and let's redefine. Let's redefine. Is everybody with us? Does everybody know what the questions are? Okay. The question is, is are, are, when, when are we saved? How are we saved? Are we being saved? And so what is the process? Something we talked about last week. What is the process of salvation? Uh, um, is it something that's immediate? Okay. In what way is immediate? And what way is it not immediate? And, 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 and I, I said that what we need to do is study that word salvation because the word salvation does not actually refer, we use it, I use it wrongly all the time. It is the word that actually speaks of the entire process, which would be election, redemption, regeneration, repentance, um, um, uh, um, um, uh, sanctification, all the way to glorification. That all is salvation. So when Paul says in Philippians, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he's not talking about work out your regeneration or your redemption. He's talking about your fullness, the whole ball of wax. He's really talking about sanctification. Now, when you are saved, in a sense, you are saved when you finish the, the, the track. Okay, because you're going to continue to sin here. You're going to continue to fall short of the mark. So when you finish it, that's the completion of your salvation. However, your name, you're actually saved, if you really want to put it that way. You're saved not physically, but spiritually before the foundations of the world when the Lord wrote your name in the book of life. Because it's his eternal decree and nothing can change that. So you were saved before you were born. Before you entered your mother's rooms, you were saved in that sense. But there was a point in your life where you were regenerated, where the Holy Spirit regenerated your soul so that you could have the faith that was necessary to believe in Jesus Christ so that his sacrifice and therefore his righteousness could be imputed, applied, or decreed to you. Now, in a, sin, in a spiritual sense, man, you're saved. You're done, okay? There's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. Paul makes that absolutely clear. So you are, you're as rock solid going to heaven as, as, as if you were already there. But there's a process that he leaves you here for to complete your sanctification, but also to serve him and to glorify him. Okay, so there, there, there's a, you know, yes, you're saved and no, you're not saved. Yes, you have the Imago Dei, the image of God restored perfectly when you are glorified, but not entirely because you sinned in your past life. So you need someone else's Imago Dei, someone else's image of God. And that's why Jesus came as the perfect image of God, lived a perfect life, gave that to us, imputed it to us. That's his righteousness you'll have and not your own. time that I even thought thinking about God and 
all of it. Just one Jesus. All these millions and millions of people. And but he saved those all. So he saves. I, 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 I know there's wonders that the thing that we won't know until we know. How did, how did Jesus sacrifice? No, not sacrifice. It's just that one Jesus is redeemed his whole the whole whole crew. Yeah. yeah. Well, well that, that's he did the sacrifice. Now, the God established actually in ancient times that he would accept a blemishless, perfect sacrifice as an atonement for the sins of the people. Okay? Now, in those days, there's probably five, six million people who are in Israel and one lamb on Yom Kippur. All right? And the lamb sacrificed because God ordained it to be so and accepted it as such was applied to all those people. Okay? Now, when Jesus was resurrected from the grave, God raised him from the grave. That meant he, he accepted the sacrifice that Jesus made for all those who he had known before the foundations of the world. All those that he has elected. Not everyone. Not all of humanity. But everyone that God has designated for salvation. Each and every one of them are saved because God ordained it to be so. I know, I know it is mind blowing to think about that. It is. He did. When we just come from up, I had a study with another fellow last night uh, for something. But it was when we did our study on church history, we started at Mount Sinai, right? Yes, we did. Okay. Well, that is heavily contested. Right. There, there, there is no small contesting. The question is, is we started our church history at Mount Sinai. Now, that a dispensationalist will fight that tooth and nail. Tooth and nail. Um, uh, Br Brother Jeff, say I was teaching church history in Capetia many years ago. And we had like 1,200 pastors in, in the room. And he's, trans he's, an ex he's an almost word-for-word -word translator, you know, like the UN has, where as you're speaking, he can stay with you. But when I, when I took them back to the Cajal, the first church at, um, at, at Mount Sinai, he, st had, he had to stop and, and, and chuckle, <laughs> you know, because he's translating for me. He's got to say what I say, right? And I don't think that, um, that he actually believes, and most dispensationalists believe that the church started at Pentecost, period. Because it was like you saying, well, Constantine and all this, but I say, brother, it was Steve way before all that. The Lord has had a remnant even through all the dark, right. age, all the right. dark ages and all that. Right. The Lord Church has still been, it, it was what it was an idol or whatever they're talking about the crusades and yeah. all that. And oh, all he did not even, even go back. He's like my grandfather, who, who said that the true church started with, with Baptist. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we got a different stuff, and I said, yeah. you know, if, if you want to go by, man, it, it was stone evil. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So uh, a lot of people, what happened? Grandmother, God bless her soul. She was a, she was a, a, a woman who loved the Lord and lived with the Lord uh, all of the time I knew her. But she definitely thought that if there was a heaven for Catholics, it was not the same one she's going to, uh, you know, or Presbyterians or, or anything else. That there was only one denomination, and 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 that was Baptist. And so she believed, honestly, and I had many conversations with her about this. She believed that the true church that started at Pentecost went underground and lived in the catacombs and was, was hidden for all those years. And if you wanted to make an enemy, tell her that the Baptist Church came out of Roman Catholicism <laughs> and the Reformation. <laughs> you, you'd, you'd have a struggle on your hands. 
<laughs> but that was very typical of, uh, we grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, of Southern Baptists. That was very typical of, of the way they felt. There was one denomination, and that was Baptist, and that was it. Um, that has changed dramatically now. I mean, some of the best Reformed thought is coming out of the Baptist church. You know, uh, so that, that's, that, that is not the way it is now, but that certainly was the way it was then. Wait a minute, Janet. You were very patient. You had your hand up. Right. Yes, ma'am. As you see, if somebody getting married in your church, they may, may, it's something wrong. Like, very wrong. But how about the people, they think they write, they write church for years, and they think they're going to be saved, and they, you know, they die, and they say, no, I love Jesus, I love God, and I do everything. Nobody does everything right, okay? I think sometimes when we divide, it's impossible because it's so much. You get yeah. give, it is very difficult. Of course, of course. Not like I don't want you to cake or educate. It's not like that. It's something in your soul. Yes. yes. And yes. sometimes I feel like I don't going to get it there. You're not going to go to heaven because, because you're it's too much for me. You're a sinner, right? I, I'm, I'm too bad. Yeah. I said. You're and guess what? The, the, the devil loves to make you think that you're the only person who feels that way. That you're the only person in this church that has those kinds of theories. Okay, he isolates you. I want you to say, sorry, I want you to say like, I don't compare myself to him. Of course I'm going to be better than him. Yeah. yeah. You always compare yourself to somebody very bad, because then I feel very good. No, I don't do that. I learned this when I'm very little. Very young. And then I said, oh my God, how can I be saved? I'm a horrible human being. Because I'm not going to compare to Hitler, of course. I can't remember him now because of all. Well, you're asking a lot of questions. You're throwing a lot of questions in there. So let me see if I can answer some of them. Um, and in comparing yourself to Hitler, or Osama bin Laden, or Hamas, or any of the really big bad guys, the problem is this. If you look at God's holiness, and, and it was here at this level, and you looked at all these bad guys and they're at this level, where would any of us fall on this scale of good and bad? Here's God, perfect holiness. Here's the worst person that's ever lived on earth. You, you would be down here. Just, I mean, you couldn't even see the difference between the two because in the face of God's holiness, we're all horrible sinners. So therefore, that's the most valuable thing any of us can know, is that we're sinners. That's what I was saying. That, that, that boy who's in the pigsty is more blessed than the Pharisees that are talking to Jesus. Because the Pharisees think they're righteous. The boy knows that he's lost. And to know that you're lost and only Jesus can save you is the greatest blessing that anyone can ever have. And that's why I can say that a people who have, have reached the bottom of the barrel um, are the ble most blessed people around, you know, because the unblessed are ones who go to their grave thinking that they're righteous enough without Jesus. Now, the problem, that, and you started out by saying this problem, there's a lot of churches where they say, oh, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, and they really don't know him because they don't obey him. And so that's why what we do here is so important. It is the word of God. That's the only authority we have. And so therefore, what is the, all these different churches, all of them teaching different things, all of them, well, most of them with very convincing pastors up there that are, are, are putting forward their theology, and they can be extremely convincing and therefore con extremely confusing. That's the reason we have to continually go back and say, there is only one authority that we actually have, and that's the word of God. That's what God told us and wrote down for us. That was the banner of the Reformation, soli, sola scriptura. 
okay, scripture alone, not scripture plus what the Pope says, not scripture plus what this preacher says, not even scripture plus what I say, but scripture alone. That's the only authority we have. And that's how we can know the difference. The more we know scripture, the more we can tell where the false prophets are because we know the original. And like you said, you go to some weddings and uh, it's not hard to, to tell that that's a counterfeit, right? It, that's not really. Uh, you, you get two men who want to get married or two women who want to get married. Guess what? I'm sorry. That's not a real marriage. I don't care how what you make it out to be. It just isn't. I, I can see the counterfeit because I, I've read Revelation 2, 1 and 2. And I've seen the way God intended it back in the Garden of Eden. So... I know that. I know that. I, I, I say to my friends, I say, I'm sorry. I know that. I'm and, no less. And, 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 and I, I, I wasn't okay. I was using that as an example. Okay, sorry. That's okay. It's bad. So. Revelation 1 and 2 and Genesis 3, where God talks to a woman and God talks to a man on what their result will be. So reading that, reading that word, talks about the woman and she'll have pain in childbirth and pain in grief for children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. But when I look down at the bottom here, it says that for really means against. So you will, have, you will not, as a, as a wife, you will be in rebellion. Curses is that you won't be honoring your husband. You'll be fighting this rebellion against him and want to rule over him. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, and then you can go on. But that's extremely revealing because prior to that time, God specifically, if you look at the curses of the fall, most of them have to do with marriage and family. See, m most of them do. The man's going to have to go into foreign places to find work because the ground's going to fight him back. And so what's he going to do when he goes to foreign places? He's going to be around other women, and there's going to be problems within the marriage contract, and the woman is left home with the children, which means problems between them. And the, the whole issue is the man now is going to rule the woman. There never was, a, there, there never was the mention of rule in the garden. There was never a mention of rule between Adam and Eve. They were to rule together and to subdue the kingdom together, okay? That's the way it was planned. They were complementary, and that's a bad word in our culture, complementarianism, but that's exactly the way God made it. He made the woman to be everything the man wasn't, the man to be everything the woman wasn't. Together, they were a superhuman. Together, they were the, the person that God wanted to rule his kingdom. And so therefore, when the fall occurred, that was broken, and so therefore, now the woman is going to want to rule over her husband and will not accept. Before that, she was completely comfortable in her skin. I mean, there is, in, in a true relationship between men and women, between a husband and a wife, the husband is a, the kind of husband that the wife wants to submit to. Okay? You can't ask a wife to submit to a man who is not worth submitting to. So, so it's a two-sided thing. Okay, so the woman would be submissive to a man that she wants more than anything else on her life to submit to because he's the kind of man that she wants to submit herself to. So that's the reason Jesus says, Paul says in Ephesians, husbands love your wives, how? Like Christ loved the church. And these men come up and say, hey, my wife is supposed to be submissive because it, it says my, my, my wife is supposed to be submissive. Did you read what he said? Love your wife like Christ loved the church. And gave his life for her. Not just died for her, but gave his life for her. So don't talk to me about submission. <laughs> I'm sorry, I interrupted. That, that's that's, a, that's a, a subject, you know, that's dear to my heart. Because I, I, I teach that. And the misconceptions between men and women are huge. And if they would just go back and read Genesis, they would get it. But very few people do. Okay, you were talking about Revelation 1 and 2. Sorry. No, I, that's what you said. I, didn't, I don't know what Revelation 1 and 2 says. Oh. You were mentioning that, that, that that also brings us out. I think what you just said about marriage. 
Revelation 1 and 2. That's your Revelation 1 and 2. Where? Genesis 1 and 2. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I might, I might have been on the wrong side of the book. You know, I, I get, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm backwards, and so I, I, I lose track of where I am. So, yes, Genesis 1 and 2 is what I'm at. You know, because marriage isn't, I don't see anything about marriage except for Christ holding the church together in that sense. Then with the man, it doesn't talk about, it talks about the work. That's what you said, because if, he, if it, the, the toil and the work isn't right there, the land isn't there, he has to go and travel, and, and then she's left at home. And, 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 and the land is going to fight him back, back right? right? Yeah, so land is not going to produce. So when there is land that does produce, what are the people who live in lands that don't produce want? They want your land. So war occurs. What happens when a man goes off to war? He doesn't come back. And the woman is left alone to raise the children by herself in a male-dominant world. Everything gets upside down. Everything falls apart. When you apply those curses and you actually apply them to the real life of what has actually happened, that is the undoing of everything that he did in the garden as far as making man and woman in the, in the way that he did. The man loving the woman as Christ loved the church. I guess, the, how does that come out practically then? How does, how does it come, come out, out practically for the man man to love the woman as Christ loved the church? Um, men don't like to hear this. Men don't like to hear this. But it is to, what did, what did Jesus do? What did God do in order to save his church? Just Let's go to Philippians 2. What did God do in order to save his bride? He humbled himself. And he placed humanity above his own desires. He humbled himself even before the rest of humanity. Jesus humbled himself before the church. He lived for the church, if you want to look at it that way. He died for the church, if you want to look at it that way. That is what he did. That's the bride that he wants to purify and take back to his father. Purify and take back to his father. You know how many men are actually interested in their relationship of the purity of their wives? Purifying them so that they will be presented as a... Uh, as a purified and glorified bride to their Lord Jesus Christ. You know how many men are actually happy with the fact that their wives love Jesus more than they love them? Very few. Very few. Okay? And so therefore, you, you, you wonder what's wrong with marriage. You wonder what's wrong with the world. Men don't ha I'm sorry, men. Forgive me. Don't, don't, don't. I, I, the reason I talk on one side of this issue the reason I talk on one side of this issue, usually, is because most of the problems that I face as a pastor between husband and wife are the men. Almost always. There are so few. If you've got a good man, be th yeah, keep them. Be so thankful. They are so few. They are so few and far between. And it doesn't mean they're perfect, it doesn't mean they don't get on your nerves, that don't mean you don't want to throw them out the door sometimes, but you know something, it is the, the, the integrity of a man who loves his wife and cares for her and places her, her life above his own, so that he could, if he, not just to step in and take a bullet for her, but to live for her, okay? That's the kind of man, actually, that a woman is happy to submit to. Don't ask her to submit if you're not going to be that kind of man. Okay. <laughs> I, don't even know, I don't even know how we got on that subject. But yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. 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 Yes, ma'am.
to the Lord. And um, in First uh, Peter 5 and 7, it teaches that if a man does not honor his wife, then his prayers will be yes. That's something when you think about it. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I don't think that anyone can truly read the scriptures about what it has to say about marriage and walk away and say that it is not of the deepest importance to the Lord. It, it, no, no one can say that. And, and, and that, that said, there's a whole bunch of women who aren't married, a whole bunch of men who aren't married. And so therefore, the perfect relationship is restored through Christ. And, and he becomes the husband uh, 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 in, in that sense. Uh, and and a, a very a, a relationship that a, a couple have a hard time having in a, in a very special way. So, yes, this is, okay. I'm sorry, Steve. Uh, it, you, you're going to continue the conversation. Oh, okay, you're going to switch it. Okay, good. Yes, sir. Um, what's the lesson that we get? Take from the garden about the serpent. Um, you know, I always thought I was told that the serpent was Satan, and yet later on we, uh, in Job, Satan is talking to God, and he obviously not in the form of a, right. not a serpent, right. and then later also we hear about, uh, I, think, I think Jesus said he saw Satan, oh, a, beautiful, right. a beautiful angel falling from, from heaven, uh, so transition from a serpent to a beautiful angel seems to be a gap there. Well, I, I think that if we were talking about a physical being, but we are talking about a supernatural being. Now, there are certain things that even in a supernatural being, like an angel, which Satan, of course, is an angel, a fallen angel, there are certain things, attributes of God that are non-communicable that are God's and God's alone. But we do know, and Job is a great example, Job gives us such a, 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 a view into Satan. Because when God allows, first of all, all of the calamity to happen to Job, God says, just don't kill him. All right, so we know that it is Satan that is causing all that calamity. And in the second chapter, when he says, oh yeah, you know, you, 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 you still put a hedge around him personally. Let me attack him personally. Let me give him all of these evil boils and, and things like that, and then he'll curse you. And God says, fine, go ahead and do that. Just don't kill him. So Satan has some powers that are immense. And he takes different forms. Even Paul said that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Okay, so obviously he's not in just one form. That he's able, as demons are able to do, to indwell a physical being. Now, if, if a demon can indwell a pig or a, a group of pigs, then he can indwell a serpent. And that doesn't mean that he is a serpent, although in Revelation he's called a dragon, you know, which sometimes is called a serpent, sometimes it's called a slug, but it's, 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 a, it's a, uh, certainly an, an animal-like picture. So I don't, think it's, I don't think that the fact that Satan was a serpent in the garden um, was an indication of his actual appearance. I think that he indwelt that, that particular animal at that time. Um, but again, that's, that's my best guess based on some of the other things we learn in Scripture. Because, I, I mean, the, 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 the demon wouldn't have asked Jesus if he would throw him into the pigs if they were not able to indwell the pigs. And the pigs rushed down the thing into the water, so obviously <clears throat> there's some relationship there. What that is, I wonder about that. I wonder what a demon indwelling actually is like. And I know that during Jesus' day, it was very prevalent 
and, and in fact, the prevalence of demonic activity throughout the history of the world seems to have focused around times of great revelation, great periods of time. Um, that, like for instance, some of the magic arts of the of, of Pharaoh's magicians and things like that. They they seem to be borderline on actually. These are these sound like actual um, supernatural events that they're doing. Um, could be smoke and mirrors, but the demons are able to in some way do miraculous things. So I'm sure that's just what what that was. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted a question. Um, would you say that the New Testament, the New Testament church's birthday would be Pentecost? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yes. Now, what I was saying the question was, would I say that the New Testament church birthday creation was Pentecost? Absolutely, without a question. That was when the Holy Spirit came upon the church. The question that is being raised is: Is there any connection between? the Old Testament people of God and the New Testament people of God? Or is there a clean break? And our, our dear, for the most part, brothers and sisters who are dispensational in their beliefs believe that there is a clear line between Old and New Testament and never the two shall meet. That there is a, that there's a dispensation of God's grace Actually, there's like seven or eight of them, you know, and, and several different people even grew it beyond that. But there's a dispensation of God's grace that is in the Old Testament rather than covenants. There are dispensations, and the grace is actually different in each one of them. And so, therefore, there's a line between the Old Testament, and they would disagree vehemently that there is a connection between old and new. And so, but that helps, doesn't it? It helps explain some things, because if, the ch if that is true, if that is completely true, then I would be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't baptize a single child. I, I would be a, 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 what's known as a cradle baptist, a, a, born, a born, born again believers. I would only baptize born again believers because to me, that is what the New Testament says. And if there's no connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, then I, I wouldn't be able to do that, but I don't believe that there is no connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I believe that it is a flow that starts at Mount Horeb in the first gathering of the Kahal, the congregation, and it flows all the way through with many bumps and, and bruises, many pitfalls, but it goes all the way through, and this is, that's the olive tree that we have been grafted into. I mean, if the church doesn't exist, then what are they talking about? What kind of olive tree are we grafted into? If these aren't the people of God that we have now become part of, then what on earth does that mean? So if that's true, then, well, if circumcision was always something that was done on the eighth day as a sign of the covenant, then why wouldn't that continue? Why wouldn't that same concept continue into the New Testament with baptism when um, um, there's nothing that says no, that's not it? So you see, it, 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 makes a, it, 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 it explains why we believe what we believe. And, and if, if, if you don't solidify the fact that, hey, we, we believe that the Old Testament flows into the New Testament and that the people of God have always been the people of God, and if you want to get right down to it, there are two threads starting with Cain and Seth. Cain and Abel, of course, Abel is killed. But there are two, two lines that start at that time and are woven all throughout history. You know, kind of stops at Noah, but then once again takes right off. And there are, there are the, the, the city of God, as, as Augustine calls it, and the city of man. And there's two cities that are built throughout human history. So it actually starts in the Old Testament. Yes, ma'am. If it hadn't been for the Jewish people denying that Jesus was the Messiah, that there really wouldn't be a division between Old and New Testament? Is that an oversimplification? Um, I would say so because 
the, the, I, I, because I say that there's a continuation of God's people from ancient times to new times, would be wrong of me to say that the covenantal relationship that God is making with his people in his plan of redemption did not come to its consummation with Jesus. And so therefore, from that point on, everything changes. Okay, so yes, there would always be a divide between, and God himself made the divide because he went silent for 400 years, okay, prior to the coming of Jesus. And, and Jesus is the consummation of all the Old Testament covenants. He's, he's bringing it to a conclusion, but Jesus himself said, hey, you cannot put this new wine in old wineskins, it's going to burst, all right? You, you, you can't put an, a patch on, an old patch on a new piece of cloth, it's going to tear, so therefore, there's a new vehicle, there's a new mechanism. The New Testament church is the New Testament church. So I still think, no, there is a division. There's a consummation, but now we are in what is known as the church age. We are in the gospel age. We are in an age where God speaks directly to people in their hearts and not through priests or kings. So everything has changed with Jesus. So yes, there's still a... A, a, a whole new covenant that Jesus brought, whole new salvation, whole new church, whole new relationship, but that is built upon the foundation. When Paul says that the church is built upon the foundation of the apostles, he doesn't just say apostles. He says prophets and apostles. The, the, old, the old Testament is just as much a part of the development of the church, but you don't want it to be, uh, on, you run into all kinds of trouble there. That's what the Seventh-day Adventists have done to a degree. They, they have no, no, no division whatsoever. We're still under the old dispensation. So we worship on Saturday like the Jews do. We, we, uh, you know, we don't believe in original sin type of, of situation. So, so yeah, it's, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, in some ways it is, but we don't want to lose the incredible distinction between what Jesus did when he came and how everything changed. Okay, as usual, I have all these great questions for you, and we don't have time. Um, it's, it's time to, to go. Um, maybe I will save them till next week, because this passage that we looked at, it, it really does beg some questions about, um, well, why does God do some of the things that he does? And why did he allow the serpent in the garden? Why did he allow the sun to leave? You know, why, why, why these things? I mean, there's some big questions that are asked that, that uh, aren't, aren't easy, and I couldn't address them in the sermon, but I was going to address them here. So maybe we'll address them next time. But let's, uh, let's close up and let you guys go home, and uh, we'll see you back next week. Heavenly Father, we are very, 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 very grateful that, and going back to our, our initial conversation, without your word, we would be lost. Without your word, and without the belief and understanding that it is your word. And the, we know that that belief and understanding doesn't come from us. We know that that is a gift that you have given us. The gift of belief, not just in your son Jesus, but in your word as well, and what it means. And so we are very grateful for that. We, we just pray that you'll keep us true to it as we continue to make our way through this wicked and fallen world. As Paul said, that we will continue to be lights in this world, but also that we will stay true to your word and we won't, we, we won't turn from it to the left or to the right. And we'll give you the glory for that in Christ's name. Amen.